the, sh the sweeteners that you find. If my pen, if my, if my screen wants to work today. So the next one past glucose is galactose. So you probably remember we've talked about lactose with lactose intolerance. So we talked about how enzymes are important in breaking up even di simple disaccharides. So lactose is one of the components that you find in lactose. And you can kind of see that just from the name because it kind of has lactose in the name. So that's kind of a good trick or clue to remember that that's part of milk sugar. And then remember we talked about how because carbohydrates have chiral carbons, Galactose with those four chiral carbons down the center. So remember that all four of those that are in the middle, that if you flip even just one set of hydrogens and alcohols, that you can make different combinations of chiral carbons. And galactose is really only different from glucose by that carbon four. So remember numbering carbon one, two, three, and there's carbon four. So remember that glucose, carbon four, the alcohol group is on the right, galactose, the alcohol group is on the left. That's really the only difference. Other than that, it looks exactly the same. But that one difference makes this not your blood sugar. <laughs> Just that one difference, the body actually absorbs galactose and then converts it to glucose in order to be used. So that's just sort of an, like reminding you that it's extremely specific, the shapes that molecules have, the orientation that some of these groups have. So an alcohol being on the right or left side of a chain makes that much of a difference. So one that you probably haven't heard of, but you probably actually have heard something and not even known it, is mannose. So mannose is not one that you usually hear about when you're just talking about a general simple sugar, but mannose is one that's found in cranberries. It's not a really sweet sugar, like if you've ever eaten a cranberry, they're super tart tasting. Yes, you're know, like, <laughs> yeah, most like if you get cranberry sauce, like it actually has a whole lot of sugar in it just to make it tolerable to balance this, the acidity or the sharpness of a cranberry. And in fact, mannose gets absorbed but it's not utilized, you don't use it for energy. Instead, it gets flushed out by the kidneys. But here's where its benefit comes into play. So it has been shown that as mannose kind of like exits the body, filtered out by the kidneys, passes down the ureters to the bladder, and then exits the body as urine, mannose actually binds bacteria. So if there's any bacteria in the urinary tract, which would be the case if you have a what? if you have a UTI, okay? So it actually helps to bind bacteria and flush that out of the urinary system. So that is the old adage. People always said, if you have a urinary tract infection, what do you drink? Cranberry, Cranberry juice. juice. So there's actually like a scientific reason why that this actually comes into play. Looking at it again, what would you call mannose? So how would you define that, carbo that carbohydrate? It'd be a what? The number of carbons? And then where's that double bond oxygen? What would you call that? Hmm? Aldo. Aldo, good. Hexose, sweet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so remember the aldo, because it's the aldehyde versus a ketone, because that double bond oxygen's on the end, and there's six carbons. So remember, if you don't see a C, but you see the little cross, remember that that's kind of like a weird skeletal structure, and each of those is actually a carbon. So that's an aldohexose. Fructose. Fructose is probably like the second most important simple sugar, glucose being number one by far, because fructose is part of table sugar. Fructose is your fruit sugar. Fructose is actually the sweetest of all of the sugars. It is about... 50% sweeter than table sugar, so it's really a higher sweet, and remember that's all how your taste cells respond to it. So it has a couple of these characteristics, commonly known as fruit sugar. Honey is almost entirely fructose. Table sugar, sucrose, part of that is fructose. They say it's the sweetest of all of them, but it's a little bit different than mannose or glucose, and that's because it's a what? How would you name this? It's a keto hexose. It's still a hexose. Count them again. So start at the very top. 
right? So you've got the carbon at the top. Remember, that's not chiral because it's got two hydrogens. Those four in the middle, so remember that the crosses, these are all carbon. So if you count, there's six. So it's a keto hexose. So it's really the only keto hexose we talk about typically. Most of them are aldo. So it's only going to be Pentose, those are the most common ones. So we've got to talk, there's a pentose next. So we're, you're, you're like drawing me right along the line. So we're doing really well. <laughs> okay, but in identification, just remember, if I ask you, it just count the carbons in the chain, that tells you whether it's a hexose or pentose. And then just look where that double bond oxygen is. If it's on the end, it's an aldo. If it's the second carbon, then it's going to be a keto. It's only those two mm -hmm. So look at this one. Okay, so these are ribose and deoxyribose. So these are what? Count the number of carbons, they're only. So that makes them, mm -hmm, they're pentoses. And in front you would have an aldo, right? So remember the aldehyde is the one that's on the end. So ribose and deoxyribose. So just thinking about them, how are they familiar? You've seen them in what? If you've had any biology. <laughs> yeah, the nucleic acids. RNA is ribonucleic acid. The name ribo is because it contains the sugar ribose. Whereas DNA, its name, the D of DNA, stands for deoxyribose, which is the other sugar, the one that's over on the right. So DNA is what's contained within the nucleus. Remember, it's your genetic information. We'll talk about DNA and RNA more in a future chapter, but this is just like one of the differences between DNA and RNA. The only difference is what? What do you see between the two? Carbon number two, the only difference is that DNA, its deoxyribose is missing a, an oxygen. That's the only difference, okay? But again, just those little differences become really key important because DNA is complete set of genetic information. RNA is what you use to make a protein, okay? So they're really very different uses in the cell, but those sugars are really very similar. And if you think of the name deoxyribose, that means it's a ribose without an oxygen because it's deoxyd, which just means like an oxygen has been removed. So that's sort of where that name came about. Just as a side, the other place that you will find ribose in combinations of sugars, you, they might be components that are used in producing vitamins. So riboflavin, because of the ribo part, riboflavin is vitamin B2. B vitamins, there's a whole group of them. Again, we still have to talk about them in the solubility section, but ribose is one of the many B vitamins, and that's where that name comes from. So you'll see those off and on in different molecules. All right, so now we get to how monosaccharides combine to form disaccharides and then polysaccharides. So in this, although we draw and think of these monosaccharides, and we talk about them as an aldohexose or a keto pentose. We think about them as being this straight chain. But do remember, and I brought models, do remember that, and both of these are D-glucose. I'm going to start one on one side and one on the other side just so you can look at them. So you see the double bond oxygen here, okay? That's the aldehyde, so it's on carbon number one. So if you're going to hold it correctly, like think of it as a straight chain, Make sure you put the aldehyde on the end and you can count the five black carbons going down. Now, if you're thinking about like how are the alcohol hydrogens positioned correctly, the way that you look at them is always to look so that the two groups sticking off to the side are pointing towards you. Do you remember those Fisher projections? They look like wedges. Do you remember wedges mean they always point forward? So you would have alcohol group on the right for carbon two. Then you'd have to flip to look at carbon three, see the alcohol groups on the left. And then you'd flip it around to look at carbon four, see the alcohols on the right. So remember it's right, left, right. And then the last one is sticking off to the right as well. Okay, so but when you look at it, you're like, well, it's pretty hard to see that just from randomly looking at a ball and stick structure. Just take a minute and kind of look at it, flip it about, pass it around so that other people can see it. This one's just identical. This one's a little nicer. Is. 
just take a minute to kind of look at it and look at glucose. Now remember when we were talking about um, functional groups, when we talked about alkanes versus alkenes versus alkynes. Remember that that's carbons with single bonds versus a carbon bond that's a double bond versus a triple. And I told you the more bonds you have, the more reactive they are. So in glucose, that double bond oxygen, the aldehyde, even in fructose, if you're talking about the ketone, those are more reactive than what a single bond would be. So like a carbon with an alcohol, where it's a single bond oxygen, single bond hydrogen, that's more stable than having that carbon with the double bond. So if glucose could get rid of that double bond, it would actually be more stable. So this is the reason why you typically don't see sugars just written out in the straight chains. When they form bonds with other sugars, they do it as a ring. And the whole reason is just that it's a little more stable without that double bond. So now here's how it happens. And I'm not going to expect you to draw this, okay? But I am going to like walk you through so you can see, here's the straight chain of glucose. Remember that's the only sugar that you should be able to recognize is D-glucose, the most abundant monosaccharide. But if you kind of look at D-glucose and then look at those two rings that are on the right side. <laughs> so in this, it really comes down to the shape that you have. Let me see back this one. Okay, so if I have the straight chain like this, it's basically up and down, aldehydes on the end. Now, you do remember single bonds rotate. So this molecule has this ability to do this flipping and flopping about. Well, if you rotate carbon one, that double bond oxygen snuggles right up next to the oxygen of carbon number five. So do you see that if I have it arranged, and this is really like the perfect arrangement right here, do you see how they set side by side? So they come up really close. And that means now, so if this double bond oxygen, if this bond opens, which is what happens right here, so this double bond opens, and in doing so, it has, because the hydrogen of carbon, of the alcohol on carbon five is super close, it's right here. So that hydrogen gets moved over onto the oxygen, and that creates the link between the alcohol's oxygen of carbon five and carbon number one. So you end up with this. You end up with this oxygen spanning carbon five and carbon one. This oxygen is actually carbon five's oxygen. Carbon five's hydrogen ends up on the end of what was the double bond oxygen. So let me just show you how it happens. So it's sitting this way. So if you look, you can see how these are like side by side. So double bond opens. So if the double bond opens, do you now see that carbon's like got an empty bond, right? So now it's got to go somewhere, okay? Because carbon, remember, has to have four bonds. So what happens is, is you're going to have the hydrogen get swapped over onto that oxygen that broke its double bond. So now it's an alcohol. And then see how you got an empty spot, right? An empty stick or an empty bond. And you got the hole, so those two link together. So now do you see that there's no empty holes, but now there's no double bonds. So this is a little more stable than how that double bond oxygen was. Now do you see the ring? So that's how you end up forming this ring. So it forms just because it's a little stable. A little more stable is a ring than it is is that open just because of the double bond. But what does this mean? It's reversible. Right? Remember, if you got an arrow that goes both directions, that's a reversible reaction. So this can actually flip back. So it can open and it can close. It can open, it can close. So the way that you would go about doing this and identifying how this molecule is formed from this is a couple of steps, but I'm going to walk you through them. So really, here's the steps. So you'll always start off, so the carbon that had the double bond, and with glucose, it's always carbon one, right? Because that was the aldehyde all the way up at the end. So you start by putting that carbon one 
put it over kind of on the far right. It's gonna be the far right of the ring. It's always gonna be like that right corner is carbon one. And then I always say, you put your carbon chain down and it looks like an upside down question mark. So it's gonna go down, across, up, up, and then up. So if you think of a question mark, but flip it upside down. So carbon number two comes down. Cover number three goes exactly across. Carbon number four is always gonna be like just across from carbon one, like straight across. So four will be here. Five comes up. And then six does not have a chiral carbon, so you just list it, right? So remember six is CH2, two hydrogens. It's not chiral, so you just list it as it is. So do you see how you list the carbon? So the carbon chain will always start like the double bond oxygen that forms the ring, always on the far right, just form sort of like this little hexagon shape is what it ends up looking like. All the way up, this one ends up being carbon number six. So I've just done them from one to six. From five to one, carbon five and carbon one, these ones get linked by oxygen. So that's why you oftentimes see, like if they people draw glucose or you see like these little like quick drawings of glucose, it's a little hexagon with a little zero. It's not a zero, it's an oxygen, like in that upper right corner of the ring. And then that little stick kind of represents carbon six sticking up. So that's a real common sort of short way of trying to draw that ring structure. So then the question becomes, okay, well, where are the hydrogens and where are the alcohols? So notice the ones that are here on carbon two, three, and four. So how are those positioned? So the rule is when you're looking at a straight chain, all of the groups that are on the right of the straight chain always point down when you form a ring. So these ones, you're always going to point them down. So that means on carbon two, so this is carbon one, carbon two will have an OH. Carbon three is gonna have a, what's carbon three? An H is gonna have the hydrogen, and then carbon four is the OH. The ones that are over on the left side, those are the ones that are actually gonna be pointing up. So this, over on this side, these are the ones that point up. So that means carbon number two has a hydrogen, carbon number three has the alcohol pointing up, carbon number four has the hydrogen. So now remember, carbon number five, that one down, the oxygen of carbon number five is actually the oxygen that is in the ring. So that's that O. That hydrogen of the alcohol group ends up going over onto carbon one. So the only thing left is this hydrogen. So this hydrogen just points down off of carbon number five. Because that's the only one, notice that that carbon five has three bonds. That fourth bond for carbon number five is just a hydrogen. Okay, so all groups that are on the right side of the chain will point down all on the left are gonna point up. Um, what do you do about the H on the um, aldehyde at the top? Okay, yeah. that's the last one. Oh, okay. Uh huh. So the last one, so like this is, when I get to draw them, I just do the little question mark. Then I look at the straight chain, everything on the right would be pointing down. Everything on the left is gonna be pointing up. The last thing is, well, what about carbon one? Do you see that it looks like carbon one only has two bonds right now? You know it's gotta have four. So carbon number one, remember this double bond oxygen opened and gained, it pulled the hydrogen off of carbon five's alcohol. So where does that go? Well, sometimes when the double bond opens, it really like depends on the double bond. So in this one, I had this bond of the double bond open. And if I kind of take and hold this, so I'll try to like hold it so that it's positioned just like this. So do you see the oxygen part of the ring? So this would be carbon one. See, and you can tell, because remember it's the long sticks. So that's where the double bond was. So that's carbon one, two, three, four, five, and then six is the one sticking up. So you would say this alcohol group is pointing which way? 
Do you think it points up or down? This one. What do you think? So remember, if this is flat, like the ring is sort of straight on the board, do you see that this looks like it sticks up? Whereas this hydrogen one looks like it's pointing down. So I've got this sticking up. If it sticks up, I call that the beta form. And the reason is, is I can take this other one, grab me the other one, and I, if I open, hopefully I open the right thing, because that's always a challenge in that. You can flip and put carbon one and carbon five close together, and I break, if I break this one, probably not, then it will, this is my, my, this is my, my old model gift that like oh, see if I can put it back in. So if I have this, it breaks, it swaps hydrogen with this one, the carbon number five. Let's see if I can make this one look alpha. Complete left if I do. So this one, yeah. Uh-huh, it is. Yay. <laughs> doesn't always happen. All right, so I'm holding this one. I'm going to try and hold this one exactly the same so that you can kind of do like a comparison. So I'm holding these two. Do you see that this alcohol group on carbon one looks like it's sticking down? Do you see that the alcohol group on carbon number one here is sticking up? Okay, so that position, this is almost random. So this was the double bond. So if one double bond, if one of the bonds breaks, it may end up pointing the alcohol group up. But if the other bond of the double bond breaks, then it'll end up pointing the alcohol group down. So that's why they say there's two possible positions the alcohol group can end up as, and that's where they added another naming level. So it's either alpha or beta D-glucose. That's just showing you where the alcohol group ends up. If it points down, that's alpha. If it points up, that's beta. So in this one, if we're drawing alpha, we would put the OH sticking up, okay? Indicating that it's in this position, so this is the one to remember. This becomes important when we start forming glycosidic bonds. So it's really the reason to talk about it so that you're recognizing what kind of bonds are, exist between two Sugar molecules, some we digest, some we don't. Okay? So that like kind of leads us into the next one. The H is this one. So the H is actually the hydrogen off of carbon five's alcohol. So in this one, what I had to do, so see that hydrogen? Mm -hmm. Okay? So this hydrogen, if I take and break this back off, that hydrogen was on carbon five. So it was on carbon five, but in order for this to form an alcohol, that hydrogen gets pushed over, and then that allows the oxygen of carbon five to form the ring, okay? So this oxygen is this oxygen. And this hydrogen like, gets swapped over, and it happens because these are so close when these fold. So when these fold around carbon one and carbon five, there's their oxygen. See, they sit side by side. So do you see that it wouldn't be difficult to swap the hydrogen from this one to that one? Because they like they literally like sit side by side. So the hydrogen just goes over to the other one, and then that allows the ring to form. Is that always the case with the bottom one? Like you always with the bottom one, like the H and the O is at the bottom. This the or one, this? The one on your straight one. So the bottom. Right. Yes, it's always the fifth one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's always the fifth, which is really weird because even fructose, which has its double bond oxygen as a keto, it still folds around and links on to carbon number five. And so it's just, it's just the angling of it that allows for that to happen. So it's down okay. down or up? Because I, I know you have it on Oh, that one's, no, I, yeah, I have it wrong. Sorry. So the OH should be down. Where did I put my pen? <laughs> so the OH on this last one, sorry. That's beta. So beta is down, is up, and alpha is down. So this should be like this. So it should be OH, that is alpha, and H up here. 
So I'm not going to ask you to draw this. <laughs> I am not, but I tell you this so that you know when you see a ring structure, you really always look at the right corner of the carbon, the ring, right? So always look at the right corner carbon because if it's alcohol group points down, that's alpha. If the alcohol group points up, then that's gonna be beta. So it's really this, no matter which kind of sugar, so if I'm looking at galactose or I'm looking at glucose, if I give you a ring structure, just put a note, always look at that right corner of the ring. If the alcohol group points down, it's gonna be an alpha form. If it points up, it's going to be beta. So I went through, and I'm not gonna ask you to like go from a straight chain to a ring, but the way that those, the groups on carbon two, three, and four, their position is really determined based on where they are in the straight chain. The ones that are on the right always point down. The ones that are on the left will always point up on carbons two, three, and four. So their position's not really random. And that's again, because these are chiral carbons, right? So remember that they don't have that free rotation. So when they go into a ring shape, they kind of lock into place. Did you have another question? Let me show you one more, okay? So we'll do one more. So this is galactose, so this one's different. It's still though an aldohexose and it's still gonna do the exact same thing. So if you go through to do this, carbon one is going to be always on that right corner. Carbon one is the one that has that double bond. That's the one I wanna know where I put my alcohol group, that can be variable. But carbon two, three, four. So notice that they're on opposite sides of each other. Then going up, carbon five, then gets connected to carbon one by the oxygen. There's the oxygen. And then six, you just write it out, right? Carbon six, because there's two hydrogens, is not chiral. You don't have to determine about where the oxygen and or the alcohol groups are because it's not chiral. But now I know that this is OH, this is H, and this is H, right? Everything on the right side of the straight chain would be pointing down on carbons two, three, and four, and everything that is on the left side is gonna be pointing up. So this is H, this is OH, and this is OH. So you might see OH, and don't let that throw you. See how this looks like HO? So if you see HO or OH, that's the same. It's really just trying to show you that this is an oxygen, which is bonded to a hydrogen, right? So if I split an, an, an alcohol group and showed the bonds, so see how they would write it OH? So OH, HO, it's the same thing. Because I know sometimes like if you look at the left side of the chain versus the right side of the chain, left side of the chain, it looks like HO, right side of the chain, it's OH. It's really just telling you the carbon's attached to the oxygen, which is attached to a hydrogen. So it's just the way that they'll write them. This one though is beta. So beta tells me that I know OH is gonna stick up. The H is gonna be the one pointing down. So the beta tells me the position of the alcohol on that first carbon. So, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Came from here. Okay. So that oxygen that's part of the ring is actually the oxygen from carbon five. So the importance of this comes into play when we form a bond. So sugars combine from monosaccharides to disaccharides and then disaccharides into polysaccharides. So the link that is formed is called a glycosidic bond. Mm -hmm. the way this is, do we add the H that was on five? Oh yeah, you would. The H, so it would, and it would only ever be, no matter what, that carbon five would only ever have just a hydrogen because. Okay, just go below because you already have something above. Yes. So what makes you do just the first three? Like, how do you... The first, you mean like these ones, why they go down versus up? Yeah, like what makes you just circle those and do those three? Because you have to divide the fifth one up? Because the fifth one, the alcohol group is what forms this. Mm -hmm. Oxygen is this, oxygen. Mm -hmm. 
So that one kind of comes, it's, it's used so that it's not really, the, it's not chiral anymore in that position. So because it forms part of the ring, it only just leaves a hydrogen. And again, I'm not going to ask you to write them, but you need to be able to look at a sugar, like what we're going to do next, always look at the right corner carbon and look to see which direction the alcohol group points or which direction the bond is being formed. So in this first one, we have this linking. And in this, this is maltose, how you form maltose. You take two glucose molecules. They're both alpha D-glucoses. So alpha tells you that that alcohol group on carbon one, see how they point down? See how this one and this one both point down. So those are both alpha glucose rings. So when they link, they do a condensation reaction. So remember, if it's a condensation reaction, what is always a product? Water. Mm -hmm. So water is a product, right? Like the, the condensation on your windows, the water moisture forming when your windows fog up. So always remember like condensation water is a product. Condensation water is formed. So to make water, I got to pull a hydrogen off of one of those alcohols and I got to pull an OH off of the other. So the alcohol gets pulled off of one of the sugars, hydrogen gets pulled off of the other, H and OH is what makes H2O. Hmm? Not really. I mean, there is a mechanism to it, but not really. <laughs> so in this one, you just remember that there's going to be an alcohol pulled off of one, and then a hydrogen pulled off of the other sugar. So when you do that, do you see that that would leave like an empty bond? Okay, so there'd be an empty bond off of the left carbon, off of that, the, the left sugar's carbon. Then there would be just an oxygen without a bond over on the right sugar's carbon. And so those link together, because remember they still have to have the number of bonds to be stable. So that forms this link. So now I have like a little oxygen that spans these two sugars. That is the glycosidic bond right there. And it's linking which carbons together? One and four. Can you see that? So like if you take in count, remember, you always start counting like from that right corner. So it'd be one, two, three, four. So this is carbon one, two, three, and four. This is carbon one, two, three, four, five, and six, but see that it's linking carbons one to four. So you'll see this numbering pattern, one with a little arrow four, which just tells you which carbons of the two sugars are connected. The bond in this direction, notice that this was an alpha, that that one, the carbon that's involved in the glycosidic bond it is in that alpha position, so the OH was pointing down. Do you see that it ends up making this? So it ends up making a bond that kind of looks like a V shape, and it's because the bond from that oxygen, or sorry, the alcohol that was pointing down off of the al alpha glucose was formed in the linked, so they will call this an alpha one to four glycosidic bond. So all it's telling you is that I connected carbons one and four and carbon one had an alpha alcohol. So here's some of the variation that you can have. So in this one, I don't know, it looks, go away. Go back there. Like, so in this one, there's a little bit of difference. So there's maltose, what we just did. So can you see, see the bond comes down? So that's the alpha position. That's an alpha one to four bond. Well, how's the second one different? How cell bios look different? Carbon number one does what? See how it's angling up? So this angling up, that's the beta position. Right, so the alcohol group was sticking off of carbon one. Do you see how that makes like a different angle? 
So this one still, they're both connecting carbon one and four. They're both connecting those end, carbon one on the left, carbon four on the right. But the first one, maltose, that first carbon had an alpha alcohol pointing down, so it creates like a V. So alpha, one to four, will commonly look for like a V kind of shape, whereas if it's beta, it's going to have this weird diagonal kind of arrangement. So this is the beta. You can digest things that have alpha glycosidic bonds. You can't digest things that have beta. So that position difference makes a great difference for future things. So the polysaccharides we're going to talk about. So now, three big, three big disaccharides. One is maltose. Right? So we talked about glucose. We talked about fructose. We talked about galactose. Those are the monosaccharides. We talked about ribose. These are the disaccharides, so maltose. They always call maltose is considered like a malt sugar or a grain sugar. Maltose is a sugar that you find packed into seeds. It's present to feed the embryo of the plant when it germinates and starts to grow before it starts to make its own energy. They malt barley as a way of to use for fermentation to make alcohol. Notice that the bond type, it's an alpha one to four glycosidic bond. We can digest this. So if you eat, if there's maltose in anything that you eat, you make enzymes to be able to digest this. So this is digestible. So maltose, remembering that it's two glucoses, remembering that it's grain sugar, remembering that if you see this molecule, could you recognize it's an alpha one to four? So I don't expect you to like memorize the structure of glucose, but if I gave, or maltose, but if I gave you the, this structure, could you tell me that that's an alpha one to four? Easy way to remember, they look like they're side by side and it's a V-shaped bond, okay? Because that means that carbon one had an alcohol group pointing down when it formed the link. Are we only doing this with um, ones that have like the hexanes, Yes. Well, there is one, sucrose has fructose in it, which looks a little different. That's the next one. But this one's lactose. We've talked about lactose a lot. <laughs> so we've talked about lactose being milk sugar present in dairy. Now, lactose is one that has what kind of link? See, that's the beta. See how lactose ends up having this like diagonal bond? So it doesn't look like a V. It has the link, the alcohol group on carbon one was pointing up when the bond formed, which gives you this diagonal. So remember, alpha is always gonna look kind of like a V-shaped link. Beta is going to look like a diagonal link if you're linking one to four. I'm still linking them kind of like they're side by side, but it always then makes one sugar look like it's a little higher than the other one. They don't fit side by side easily. So we do digest this, but we have to have a special enzyme to do it. And so remember, some people stop making the enzyme lactase, and that makes it impossible for them to digest this, and they end up with all of the lactose intolerance issue. So this is digestible if you make lactase. So remember that the enzyme lactase digests lactose. So the enzyme maltase digests maltose. So they're specific. Third one. Third one is sucrose. So sucrose is the sort of oddest looking one to me because sucrose, do you see how it looks like the sugars are stacked on top of each other? And not only that, but they're actually connecting the two carbons that used to have double bond oxygens. So the top one is glucose. So remember that this was the aldehyde that then formed the ring. So what type is that? Is that alpha or beta? Alpha, because see the bond's pointing down? So it's pointing down. Usually alpha makes the nice little V shape, but in this one, the bottom one is fructose. And fructose is a ketone. Remember, it's a ketohexose. So fructose, this was fructose's ketone on carbon two. 
So it opened, formed the ring. Mol uh, glucose opened and formed the ring, and those two link together. So when looking at the fructose, see the bond angle goes up, so that means the alcohol must have been a, it must have been a beta, right? If the bond angle goes down, it would have been alpha. Bond angle goes up, it's beta. So this one is called alpha comma beta one to two. That's just telling you that the glucose is in the alpha position, the fructose is in the beta position, and they linked those two, what they call the anomeric carbons. Those are the ones that used to have the double bond oxygen. But they'll always look kind of stacked together. So in this, sucrose is table sugar. Things to remember, sucrose is table sugar. Sucrose is made of glucose and fructose. This is probably the most complicated looking one in terms of figuring out the bonding, not one that I show you. So on the sweetness scale, so we've talked, basically we've talked about all of the sugars. So that leads us to the sweetness aspect. So when they decided, okay, when you taste different sugars, some sugars are sweeter than others, and it really just depends on how your taste buds respond. So they came up with a sweetness scale, and sucrose is kind of like the standard. Sucrose is table sugar. So they said, okay, so table sugar has got a sweetness of 100, and we will compare all other sugars to it. So 100 being kind of like the norm. So there are things that are sweeter, things that are less sweet. So the sweetest, I told you, is fructose. It's about one and a half times sweeter than table sugar, which is why they put high fructose corn syrup on things that you want to be sweet. Why? Because it's one and a half times sweeter than just using sucrose, using table sugar. And so when your brain gets a hold of sugar like that, your brain thinks, oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> and it sets up the behavior pattern so that then what do you crave? sugar. <laughs> so it actually, it actually triggers that really sweet sensation. And sweet is always a pleasurable sensation. And that encourages behaviors to include those sugars. So if you've ever tried to cut out sugar, good grief, it's impossible. If you've ever tried to cut out sugar in your diet, like you will like crave it like hard, hard crave it. Like you're like, is there any sugar in this house? <laughs> is there anything at all? <laughs> you're like, hmm. <laughs> but once you get past it, then your brain like kind of calms down. But if you're in a pattern where you eat candy a lot, like that's part of your like behaviors and it's your brain that likes it because it's sweet and that's a pleasurable sensation, which is pretty, pretty crazy that like a lot of the children's cereal all have high fructose corn syrup because that like gives a more intense sweet flavor compared to using sucrose. But now if you look at the other natural sugars besides fructose, everything else is what? Way less, right? All the other sugars are more mild. They're not as sweet. So like, you know, if you drink milk, people say milk doesn't really taste sweet. Well, lactose has a very low sweetness. But now remember I told you if you drink lactate milk, that's the milk where lactose has been digested. So when lactose is digested, it makes what two sugars? What makes up lactose? Mm -hmm. So glucose and galactose. So see, glucose is higher on the sweetness scale. So that's why people that drink that milk say it tastes sweeter than regular milk. And it's actually just because now we've got glucose and galactose, which are both a little sweeter than lactose. So it triggers a little stronger sweet sensation. Okay. But now look at these. Here's your artificial sweeteners. So if sucrose is 100, Splenda, sweet and low, equal, <laughs> they're in the thousands, okay? Splenda is 60,000 on the sweetness scale. So that is why if you get a packet of Splenda, how much is in there? Yeah, you like tear it out and you're like, like four little white crystals, you're like, I, I guess that's right, right? Did you ever notice that? It's like, it feels like there's, you're like, is there anything in here? That is because it's so intensely sweet. When it hits your taste receptors, it triggers intense sweetness. Other thing to notice though, Splenda, what's it made of? It's a chlorinated disaccharide. So they take sucrose and chlorinate it. 
but you're sw and so it doesn't get digested. Uh huh. So because it's been at the chlorines, remember I told you shape. It's all about the shape. Changing by adding chlorine, taking off an alcohol and adding a chlorine on, it still triggers your taste receptor, but it doesn't get digested. Same thing. So like saccharin, that was originally used as a dye for denim, like in dyeing clothing. Well, someone tasted it and they were like, hey, this is really sweet. Oh, wow. And that's how, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. I mean, maybe they just had it on their hand, like, you know, like a contaminant and they accidentally <laughs> like tell me you've never like stuck your finger in your mouth. And you're like, what was that? Oh, yeah. Like, okay, yeah. same thing. So that was actually discovered. It was discovered accidentally. <laughs> Aspartame is pretty close to being natural because it's actually two amino acids. Those two amino acids, their shape triggers taste sweetness. But remember phenylalanine? What's the disease where you can't break down phenylalanine? Remember we talked about it in chapter five when we were talking about enzymes. Do you remember PKU? Okay, that they test babies when they're born to see if they have the ability to break down phenylalanine. So anybody that has PKU cannot have anything like equal. No aspartame because that would be a source, a strong source of phenylalanine. So there's actually a, a warning on a Diet Coke bottle like contains phenylalanine for people that have that disease. So all of these other ones, they're all artificially produced except Stevia. So stevia was actually in like, I don't even know who like was chewing on some stevia leaves, but somebody put a stevia leaf in their mouth and said, this leaf is really sweet. <laughs> and so then they did research and said, yeah, there is like the, a, a natural chemical found in a stevia plant. So it's actually a green plant. They grow it, they harvest the leaves, they dry them, they granulate it, and that's what your stevia is. So it's just an extract from a plant leaf it doesn't get digested, so it has no calories. All of these have that characteristic, but the other big characteristic is they trigger your taste buds, right? So then they come as a sweet sensation. You know some of this is genetic too. Some people, how does this stuff taste to you? Some people say it tastes really sweet, but other people say it tastes, to me, it tastes bitter. Like I get like a bitter taste, like I don't, like all of them kind of have an odd aftertaste to me. Okay. Some people like think that it just tastes completely like sugar. They cannot tell the difference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, that's and some of it's genetics. It tastes bitter, and it depends. It's genetics, so it really depends like how your taste receptors respond to these chemicals compared to responding to sugars. Mm -hmm. They're all bitter. So if it's not digestible, does it just sit in your stomach? Nothing sits in your stomach. Where does it go? <laughs> Everything moves. Everything moves in your GI tract. Your GI tract doesn't hang on to stuff, okay? Okay, well, it can cause troubles too, all right? I will tell you one more thing, then we're going to move on. So one more thing, xylitol, erythritol, sorbitol. All of these are called sugar alcohols, okay? So they are sugars that have had the alcohols on the sugar altered, so that they're not digestible. So if they're not digestible, they don't get absorbed and they don't affect your blood sugar. So they put these in a lot of sugar-free products. So if you've ever chewed sugar-free gum, it's gonna have one of these three, okay? Erythritol, sorbitol, xylitol. So this, this is really good. They put this in like diabetic candy. Sugar-free gum. And because they don't get digested, just like the others, they don't get digested so that they don't end up affecting your blood sugar. So somebody that has issues with regulating blood sugar, they can use that. But there is one of these that is, really should have a warning label on the box or the bottle or wherever you, whatever it contains. So any of the vet techs have any experience with any of these three? Xylitol, why? Isn't that toxic to dogs? Yes. Mm -hmm. Xylitol is toxic to dogs and cats, although you know cats aren't going to go eating xylitol. <laughs> cats are very particular. <laughs> huh? 
Well, and it can be in a lot of things. It can be, it can be used as a sweetener in a lot of like supplements or as gum or as sugar-free candy. Xylitol for you, if you eat a lot of this, I will tell you that this will cause GI upset. Like things will like run through you like really fast. <laughs> so like having the, having the Russell Stover sugar-free candies, yeah, that's fine. You have one. Don't be eating two <laughs> because it can have an extreme laxative effect. Okay, extreme. <laughs> like if you read some of the, re if you like pull up sugar-free candy on Amazon and read some of the reviews, so hysterical. Because people are like, that peanut cluster was so delicious, I ate two. And then I couldn't leave the house for the next 24 hours. <laughs> like It was like better than any laxative ever. It's like very funny. Some of the reviews on Amazon for the sugar-free candies, the negative thing well, that's kind of negative. But the negative thing from the, from the health standpoint, xylitol is acts like glucose for a dog or a cat. So if a dog eats like, and so you get these, like, have you ever seen, you know, like the, the little, little travel size gum, like the mint gum, like Trident and the... The dog gets terrible for dogs. Yeah, that's xylitol. And so if you get one that has erythritol or sorbitol, it's fine. So some of the sugar-free gums have erythritol or sorbitol. They do not affect, they, they might cause the dog to have the runs, but they're not going, it's not going to affect the dog in the same way. What xylitol does is this causes insulin secretion as if it was sugar. So depending on the size of the dog, if you're talking about a little Yorkie, they can eat like one piece of gum. The xylitol in that triggers insulin release. So what happens to their blood sugar? What does insulin do? Lowers, right? So insulin usually is released. Usually when you eat, your blood sugar goes up. Insulin brings it back down. So for an animal, a little small dog especially, they eat a piece of, of sugar-free gum and their blood sugar will go down to nothing. So then they like literally just fall out. So then you have a dog that's like not responsive. You're like, what happened? Like you just don't even know. They just like get less and less because no blood sugar, the neuro neurological system starts shutting down. So what else is there besides sugar-free gum? Sugar-free gum is really like the big culprit because people buy it in like the big car, the travel. You can buy like 60 in the little containers. You know, yeah, you're like, yeah, we got a whole bunch. Just check it. Some of it is erythritol, some of it is sorbitol. But if it's xylitol, then you need to make sure that it's put someplace safe. Okay? I like don't buy it if it has xylitol in it. So sugar-free candies. Mm -hmm. So if you get sugar-free candies, and the best thing to do is just check the label. If you have dogs or cats, check the label if you're eating anything that's like reduced sugar. Because some reduced sugar snacks and things like that will have that in it. Because look, it's about the same sweetness as table sugar. So they can put it in and it like, it's not quite as artificial tasting. Because they don't have to kind of use about, it's kind of like an equal amount. But it can cause big problems if an animal gets a hold of it. So that's like, and like if a lab, like, you know how they are. They like eat everything. And so like just two days ago, I had somebody that posted on Facebook and had a picture of that little container where the dog had like chewed on it, popped it open and eaten the gums and he passed away. Oh, I think I know exactly what you're talking about. It was the one with the little um, icebreakers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the sugar-free, the sugar-free icebreakers, the Trident White, there's a bunch of them. Some of them use erythritol, but the ones that use xylitol, that's just a big warning. So this can cause hypo, hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, and that can be fatal. If the blood sugar drops to nothing, your brain shuts down. Mm -hmm. That's why I say I feel like there should be a warning label on anything that has xylitol, but, you know, look how long it took us to get rid of trans fats. <laughs> They need sugar. Like you could give them syrup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have caro syrup, caro syrup is like high fructose corn syrup. So that has a lot of glucose in it. So like literally like rubbing it on their gums. Remember I told you, you can absorb these simple sugars can get absorbed through the lining in the mouth. 
honey would be okay. Mm -hmm. But that would be like the big concern is trying to make sure that you try to bring their blood sugar up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's just sort of warning note. Okay, so before going on, let's just do a little practicing. See if you can tell me. Look at the disaccharide that's on the left. You tell me what is the glycosidic bond. Nope. So remember, what's the trick? So this, what type of bond? One, find the carbon one. Because carbon one is the one that's going to tell you. So look at the two sugars. 99% of the time, except for, glue, for, for um, sucrose, 99% of the time, only one of the sugars is going to have carbon one involved. So which one is it, the upper or the lower? The upper. So do you see that this is carbon one? Okay, over here, this is carbon one. See that that carbon one's not involved. So which direction is the bond going? So that means it's alpha. And it's connecting carbon one and carbon what? Count. Six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Remember, it's like the upside down question mark. So that one that's sticking all the way up will be carbon six. So this is an alpha one to six glycosidic bond. So first thing to do, look at the two sugars, find carbon one, right? So always look like, look at the far right corner on each carbon, whichever one is involved in the glycosidic bond, that's how you figure out if it's alpha or beta. So if it's up, then you know that it's a beta. If it's pointing down, then you know that it's an alpha. Some books, and you will sometimes see one, see how this one has a weird zigzag? This is just a way for them to sort of put two sugars side by side that should be on the diagonal. So if you look at this, which one, the upper right disaccharide, which is carbon one on the left sugar or the right sugar? The left sugar. Can you see that this is number one? So again, one, two, I'll just number them just to help you review. One, two, three, four, five, six. Goes around like an upside down question mark. So carbon one, which direction is the bond coming off? Is it going up or down? Up, so that means it's beta. Okay, so beta will look like this most of the time, but it might look like this. And they just do that because it tends, it takes up less room. Can you see now it looks like the molecules are side by side? So in a book, if you did beta, you'd have to have the diagonal and they take up more room. So they'll do this weird zigzag as a way to just try to get the two molecules look like they're side by side. So either of those, those are both beta. Diagonal or the, looks looks like a little zigzag, both of those are going to be beta. What is that linking, beta what? One, two, four, good. Everybody see that? See the right sugar, one, two, three, four. So it's they're on opposite sides. Come down now, go down to the bottom one here. Which one, left sugar or right sugar? Which one has carbon one? The left sugar, can you see that this is carbon one? Two, three, four, five, six, just like all of them. So this means carbon one is a what? This is an alpha, see how it's pointing down? So this is alpha. So this is connecting carbon what? One to four. Mm -hmm. This is the other way you see alpha. Most of the time, alpha is going to look like the V. That's not a very good V. <laughs> but it usually looks kind of like this. So it'll look like a V. But then some drawing programs will make it look kind of like a U. So either one, do you see that this and this, same thing. Both of these, alpha. Both of those are beta up in the top corner. So remember like the zigzag is gonna be a beta or a diagonal. The V shape or the funny little U shape, those are both going to be alpha. Okay, here's another one. What's this one? First, find carbon one. Which one is it, the top one or the bottom? Yeah. Yay, very good, okay. Uh-huh. Where's carbon one? 
Uh huh. So which one is connected to that corner carbon, the top one or the bottom? See it, right? So just look at the two sugars and you're looking, okay, where's carbon one? It's always gonna be on the right side. Which one of those sugars is carbon one part of the bond? Do you see it's the bottom one? So this is carbon one, two, three, four, five, six. So see that's carbon two? Carbon two just had an alcohol on it, okay? But then looking at the bottom, see carbon one? That's connected to the glycosidic bond. So that's how you determine if it's alpha or beta. Just look at the two sugars and then like look at the right corner, which one is actually connected as part of the bond. So this one going up, it is one, two, two. Mm -hmm. So that one's kind of weird. That's a beta one to two. So carbon one is connected to carbon two. Okay, go down to the bottom one. What is this? So you look at the two. So I know this is carbon one and this is carbon one. So then I know the left carbon is the one that I've got to name alpha or beta. So this one is beta and it's connecting carbons one and four, right? Because when they're right across from each other, it's pretty straightforward. So now polysaccharides, <laughs> okay? So all these have just been disaccharides, but now look, here's six, car six sugars all linked together. What are all of these? They're all alpha what? One to four, right? So it's carbon one and connected to carbon four. Carbon one connected to carbon four. So that is very common in a polysaccharide is they'll have repeating glycosidic bonds into long, long chains. Those are all alpha one to four. What is this one? That's an alpha one to four. And you'll see them drawn like that so instead of writing alpha, they'll use the little alpha symbol, remember in radiation, the, it looks kind of like a weird A. And then parentheses, they put one arrow four, which just tells you which carbons are connected. Which one's different? What's that? So again, find carbon one, the top one. And so it's an alpha one to six. Does everybody see that? So when you look at that one, the top one is carbon one, it points down so you know it's alpha, and the carbon one then is connecting to the sugar below, which is that top CH2OH, so that's a one to six. So this leads us into the polysaccharide. So poly means many. We have the first group, these are the digestible polysaccharides. So you can think of these first two, the digestible polysaccharides. There's one that is a plant form, one that is an animal form. So the first one is the plant, starch. So when you think of starch, starch is typically packed inside of all of your grains and roots and things like that. <laughs> so when you think about wheat, rice, potatoes, Ooh, I can't spell today. Pasta. So that includes all of these breads, crackers, cereals. So anything that's inside of the grain, the vast majority, there's a little maltose, but the vast majority is going to be a starch. And the reason a plant does this is this is the food for the new plant that might form from the seed. So that's all it really is. That's why a plant bothers to make a wheat grain or a rice grain or a potato. It's just because that potato, you can cut a potato as long as it has one eye, you know, like the little like knots on it. As long as it has one eye, you can take that and put it in the ground and it'll actually grow a whole potato plant, okay? So the starch inside of the potato is used as energy for the little embryo to be able to grow into a new plant because it has to get up through the ground. It has to make some roots to get some water. So it needs energy to be able to build structures. That's really what the starch molecules are for. Well, starch is actually a combination of things. The first one is called amylose. And amylose is a chain of thousands of alpha D-glucose units. So notice the links, they're all those Vs. It's just a straight chain. The very top picture just looks like a whole bunch of beads stuck together. 
Each one of those little orange rings would be a glucose. And in fact, we would have to have like thousands of them in one long chain. That's amylose. It's only about 20% of starch, but think of it as just being a single chain. Amylose is a single chain of thousands of glucoses and they all have alpha one to four linkages. We make an enzyme in your saliva called amylase. So amylose gets digested by amylase. So amylase will actually take and begin to break this starch molecule into smaller and smaller polysaccharides, eventually getting them down, down, down to single sugars. So initially, it just goes through and starts chopping it, and then it continues chopping and chopping, and then over time, you end up with actual single glucose molecules. So it doesn't typically just go from one end, it just sort of randomly chops, splitting and splitting. <laughs> this takes time. So when you eat things like sugars, this glucose, fructose, that gets absorbed straight away. Even if you eat disaccharides, it only takes maybe an hour to digest. It doesn't take very long. Those all affect your blood sugar rapidly. Amylose and amylopectin, the next one, the components of starch, when you eat, if you look at time and you look at sugar, your blood sugar levels, you eat them, some time has to go by, usually four to six hours. So we'll say about six hours, what begins to happen? More and more glucose is made, glucose gets absorbed as soon as it's made, and so what does your blood sugar do? starts to increase. It doesn't spike like what happens with your, when you eat simple sugars, but it does increase. And so in anybody that's not a diabetic, their blood sugar starts to increase. When it gets above 110, what gets secreted? Insulin. And insulin helps to keep it from going any higher. So it helps to keep it in that same range between 60 and 110. But if you're a diabetic or if you have limited insulin secretion, if you have poor insulin receptors, then when you eat the potatoes, the breads, the pastas, the rice, the grains, what happens to your blood sugar? It goes up. And when it gets to 110, it keeps going. So both kinds of carbohydrates, simple sugars will affect your blood sugar quickly. Complex carbohydrates will also affect your blood sugar. So monitoring both like the sugars you're eating as well as the starches that you're eating as a type one or type two diabetic can really help to keep you from going into you know, potential hyperglycemia. So the last one, then we'll quit. This is the other one. So this is amylopectin. This is the other component. And this is the majority of starch. So if you look at this, what does it look like? It's just like 80% of starch. You see how it's like, it looks kind of like a tree branch, right? Lots of branching that goes on. So this again, thousands of glucoses. You've got the main chain is all alpha one to four, just like amylose. But then about every 25 glucoses, there's a branch. So the branch is an alpha one to six. So see it on that one in that example where we just looked at that. But then that branch can have a long chain of glucoses as well. And you can have branches off of there. So you get this really branch structure. So it kind of looks more, it looks bigger than how the amylose looks like. But same thing, we can digest this. But again, this takes hours, but it does end up affecting your blood sugar.